Did, uh, let's see, Cindy. Okay. I think uh, I had planned to just do, I guess, two tonight. Which I think. Uh, That's my favorite dance. My favorite wife. Your favorite and wife and only wife. She's doing good. <laughs> She's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good evening to you this evening. Hope that you've had a good day. And uh, that has been a beautiful day God's blessed us with. Uh, to see what God has for us tonight from his word, amen. And uh, do you have a good afternoon, Miss Nancy? Some good vittles. Take you a long nap. No vittles, no long nap, or... No to the first one I mentioned. Bad vittles. <laughs> Bad vittles and no nap, huh? <laughs> Good vittles. We, we went down, the, we, as we were going down the road, we seen, uh, I think it was three vultures. They were eating a uh, armadillo. Cindy and I was carrying on. We carry on with another little bit about things. You know, we passed by anyways. And then uh, I noticed when we came back, there's two others there, so they had some company come in and, and uh, share that armadillo, I guess. So uh, just things like it kind of get kind of comical to me. I, I may be kind of strange, I guess, but anyways. Well, you got a friend who's trying to dumpster dive at Walmart. Oh, really? Yeah, they lost all their uh, milk, cheeses, meats, everything. So they're throwing it all away. But they wouldn't let them get it. <laughs> it's crazy. Huh. Some of the stuff is probably bad, but uh, like the milk, but like the cheese and stuff like that, that's like throwing it all away. They could have just put it 50% off or 75% yeah. off and everybody would buy it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, thing, the, the, the thing is, like in Papua New Guinea, sorry for being, but in Papua New Guinea, me and another missionary, we look for outdated stuff. Yeah. Because we get like 80, 90% off. Cheese, um, cereals, you know, stuff on the shelf. Right. That stuff doesn't go. I mean, like milk, I wouldn't do, but all the other stuff, man, you would think we were hoarders because <laughs> it was expensive. The food was very expensive over there. So we'd look for, and they do that, but here they throw away a lot of food in this country. We're real, we're a real wasteful country, you know, that as a whole, we really are. Well, anyways. Yeah, you didn't um, think you'd get all that. Yeah. <laughs> Tell your vulture. Four, you know. <laughs> 485. 485. Let's get going. Get going, amen. This was the stuff of hell. They're just a passing through. My treasures are there. Somewhere in the blue. I can't leave the open door and I can't let it home in this world anymore. Oh, you know, I have no friend like you. Since heaven the Lord knows what to do. The angels back in me from heaven's open door and I can't let it home in this world anymore. I forgot to mention about the chorus then again. All right, here we go. Since heaven is my home, the Lord knows what to do. I'm on that one part. I'm on the second verse together now. They're all expecting me. And there's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me. And now I will go. I know that I take me through. No, I am wicked poor. And I can't be let go. This world anymore. Oh, you know, I am no friend like you. Since everything is my home, the Lord knows what to do. The angels back in me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel it no more. I have a living Savior up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I let him stand. He's waiting for me and heaven's open door. 
Just up in your land, we'll finally turn old lady. The saints are in the end, our shouting victory. The song the sweetest praise, drift back from that to the shore. Amen. How true it is. Amen. Uh, I don't uh, don't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen. Because it's not my not my home anymore. Although it's just uh, just a uh, uh, place I reside for a little while. Amen. Good to hear you sing and hit your voices uh, tonight. Uh, we'll get ready to take it for offering. Uh, but before we do, anybody got any special prayer requests uh, to mention? Any other prayer requests, Miss Nancy? Uh, I'm going to be traveling tomorrow. Get a cop coming home from Missouri. So safe, so uh, safe traveling for uh, Mr. Cox here coming from coming from Missouri. You're saying? Uh, so we'll put travels down for Miss Nancy's brother. All right. Get together Saturday. I'll get together. Yeah. I know it. Yeah. Oh, I'm just right. I love those. I thought you were gonna say armadillos. You're talking about fish fries. Okay, goodness. I know two vultures, one named Sean and one named Niels. <laughs> Goodness. There's a verse on that about a women's food. <laughs> I'm telling you. That hit you like a Big Mac on the highway, don't it? That kind of, that kind of statement does. Goodness sakes. So safe travels for uh, Mr. Cox here. Amen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any other prayer question praises tonight? Anything else? None? Just for work. For Brother Gage's work? People I work with and just uh, testimony and being able to take, take things. Amen. Amen. I, uh, of course, I mentioned work before many times, many times back for some Wednesday nights, but remember to pray for uh, the fellows that I work with, the people I work with. There's some some ladies, women that work there too, but uh, for the people there, amen. And uh, uh, pray for, continue to pray for the needs of the church here. Um, just uh, pray for all of our, uh, pray of course for the needs here, the need of a pastor. I hope that you're praying about that. And uh, pray for uh, one another, amen. Uh, thank God that uh, we have a place to come to and open his word and sing uh, sing uh, songs like, This World Is Not My Home. I'm just a passing through, amen. Victory in Jesus, we sung this morning, different songs out of the, out of the uh, hymn book. But uh, any other prayer requests or praises this evening? Yes, Ms. Abigail. Amen, amen. Thank you. Good, uh, good praise there. I, I thank the Lord as well, amen, for these that, that do come in. And... Uh, and you never know what uh, how the Lord will lead, and and uh, Drexen not only uh, of course the one young fella came, but uh, but uh, his mother as well. Amen. So good to see both of them this this morning. Anybody else a prayer request to praise for the Lord in prayer this this evening? Anybody else? No. Oh yes, Miss Quindy. I think there were something that Amen. Amen. Well, I know that uh, there's, this morning there's also some uh, unspoken, so we continue to pray for them. And uh, definitely, uh, you know, God says we have not because we ask not. And, uh, there's much uh, much in God's word about prayer. And I thank God he gives us the privilege to go to the throne of grace. Amen. So any other prayer requests, uh, praises? If not, we'll... Pray there's no frost tonight. Pray no frost tonight. It's supposed to get a little cooler, I guess, tonight. And... 
Brother Gabe was talking about his garden before, uh, before we, uh, while we was having our time of prayer back there. But uh, no frost, no frost. So we're here, we're getting on in, getting on through April, aren't we? Actually, uh, so uh, any other prayer requests or praises tonight? Any, anything else? All right, let's pray our prayer and uh, see what, uh, take these before the Lord and then you pray as I pray if you would. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love, mercy, and grace. God, we, such a needy people, in need of thy direction, thy guidance. And I'm so thankful for answered prayer. God, many times we, we don't recognize that or don't uh, mention that, but God, you, you're working all the time. I, God, you, you don't sleep. God, we think about the, the prophets of Baal and they prayed to, they prayed to Baal and prayed to their God. And God, uh, as Elijah, uh, no doubt, and, and, and uh, uh, had some humor with them that day. Maybe that, maybe, as they said, maybe their God is uh, sleeping he's, or he's, he's busy or, God, we know that you don't sleep. And God, we know that you know very well what's going on. You see all things. And God, we thank you for answer prayer. God, we thank you for uh, the privilege to be here this evening. We ask God that you would lead and direct in the service. Brother Gage, as he stands before us and, and opens, as we open your word once again, God, we pray that you would uh, just stir each heart. God, uh, God, uh, a lot of fire in us. God, to, to be the uh, light in this community as we ought to be. God, as we think about uh, not only this community, but people all over this world, God, that, uh, that are lost and undone without Jesus Christ. We pray for, uh, as Brother Gage mentioned, people he works with and people I work with, I think about, God, for souls to be saved. Thank you for these that have come, the, the two that came this morning, uh, visitors that is. God, we thank for each one that comes and the, each one that's a part here. God, we pray for those that we missed. Also this morning of our regular church family, God, uh, direct in their hearts, lead and direct, God, reach with each one. God, we pray for uh, just the, uh, the physical needs. God, we also pray for the spiritual needs of each one. God, just, uh, just uh, we pray for your, uh, pray for your strength your guidance, and, and uh, God, we pray for the need of a pastor, God, that you meet that need for us. Uh, we want who you have us to have. God, we we know that, uh, we know, God, that you uh, know what's best, and you're, uh, you're working in all these different areas. God, we, we look to thee, the author and the finisher of our faith. God, help us. God, as we pray for each of these, those that uh, also are, that'll be traveling, Miss, uh, Miss Nancy mentioned about uh, her brother, is that he's traveling. We pray for traveling grace for him. God, uh, uh, traveling grace for each of us, God, we pray. But God, we pray for these special prayer requests that's been mentioned, uh, the ones that, of course, Ms. Kelly mentioned this morning about her dad and, and uh, God uh, coming home May the 6th. We pray, God, that you continue to be with his uh, health needs as well as the spiritual needs there. God, we, we thank you, God, for, uh, just thank you for your healing touch. Uh, God, for loving and caring for us. The, uh, the one that, uh, of course, Miss uh, Gwendy mentioned there, and the unspoken request that was mentioned this morning, we pray, uh, just uh, just thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy and your grace to us. God, help us as we go forward, as we look to thee. God, we pray uh, that you bless the offering, bless the gift and the giver, and use it according to your will. God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Give a heart just like yours Where work finds a soul Everywhere that it is so Break up my fallow ground Break up my fallow ground My heart Every day, let me from the old free and the children serving me. Wicked pride and bitterness are restrained. Sinful habits keep me from the victory. Break up my fallow ground. Give a heart 
just like you. We were fine, sweet soul. Everywhere that it is so. Break my heart of sinful stone. Break up my fallow ground. My heart, your throne. Amen. 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 Appreciate that, Senator. That'll be all of our prayer requests. Amen. Amen. I tell you. Any of us can get hard-hearted. We don't watch, and, and uh, we need God to break up, uh, break up our fallow ground of our heart. Amen. Uh, let's turn over to page number uh, 516. 516. And with that, let's all stand on this one here because uh, we're going we're gonna to do a little marching in the, in the course time. All right? Does that sound all right? A bit, uh, a little bit different. I know I had you stand this morning, so I'm not, not punishing nobody, not trying to get on to you, but I uh, thought because uh, we're here... Two uh, two different uh, songs and two different uh, and the same Sunday in uh, two different songs, but uh, five hundred sixteen, uh, and on the course we'll do some marching. Amen. All right, Cindy. Come, we that love the Lord, and let our dreams be known. Join in the song with the sweet accord. Join in the song with the sweet accord. In the song, in the throne, in the song, on the throne. There we go. Where it falls, it changes to the sun. Beautiful, beautiful sun. Where it falls, it changes to the sun. The beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children, the heavenly king, but children, the heavenly king, may speak their joys abroad. May speak their joys abroad. Every people, where the chains are sound. Beautiful, beautiful sound. Yeah, we're marching out to the sun. The beautiful city of God. The hidden of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the enemy fields, before we reach the enemy fields, hold on the golden streets, or walk the golden streets. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching for to Zion. The beautiful city of God. Oh, look this verse now. Then let the songs of in every day strength. We're marching through the evangelical strength to fresh. What's on high to fresh? What's on high? We're marching to some. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching for two sides. The beautiful city of God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated there. Appreciate you participating in that. Uh, thank you for singing this evening. Amen. Brother Gabe, we'll turn over to you this evening. All right, Book of Jonah. Book of Jonah. Personally, I'd be all right if we stood for all our songs. <laughs> oh, you don't have to. Not mandatory. <laughs> no, no, no. Just because I get up don't mean you need to get up. But I tell you what, we're going to stand before the throne of God. And we're going to be standing when we rejoice. I think, personally, I think sometimes when we're sitting, we're, we're, we're too relaxed. <laughs> We're rejoicing and singing to God. And seriously, people have ailments and stuff like that. That's not, that's not, you know, <laughs> don't feel like you have to. But 
Um, I don't know. There's just something about getting your diaphragm going and all that too. So. Yeah, maybe. I was telling a guy yesterday at work or Friday at work, because we're having some issues with safety stuff. And um, I told him, I said, if the day you walked in, you were told you had to have steel toe shoes and safety glasses, it wouldn't be a problem. But because they were, there was a slackness there, now that you're trying to enforce stuff that should be there, people don't like it, you know? And, 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 and just, in the note, if you show up somewhere and they do it a certain way, but it is so hard to get people to change when you, when, when you might want to change because we didn't ever do it that way. <laughs> um, let's do some memory verses. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's do some memory verses. Proverbs 4.23. Keep thy heart with all oh, diligence, for right. out of it are the issues of life. 15.3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. 16.3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, thy thoughts shall be established. Uh, 16, 18. Pride go up before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. 22, 28. Remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have set. And 31, 10. Who can find Ecclesiastes 7, 20. For there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Huh? You always do that? I know, I know. 11 1. Yes. <laughs> amen, amen. Isaiah 43 11. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me is the Savior. Amen. Isaiah 26 3 and 4. Do you want to roll memory verse? Uh, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Uh, <laughs> we, me and Wesley, we do them every day on the way to church. Amen. Amen. Keep, it, keep it in our mind. Um, picking on you all a little bit. Uh, we'll, 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 Philippians 4, 4, and 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. 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 <laughs> Let's not add that S. Wesley gets on to me all the time. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Remember that. Always. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. Let's read 4 through 10 again. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man into his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the side of the ship and lay and was fast asleep. And a couple weeks back, we've been, we've been, what have we been talking about? There's Christians asleep. Awake. Awake into righteousness. It's a shame that people haven't heard the gospel. And there's, there's several scriptures we talked about about being awake ourselves. And here you have Jonah, who should be a help to everybody. He's sitting there fast asleep during the storm. And that's sad. We talked about that. So the shipmaster came to him and said to him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and a lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. It's kind of funny because he says that, but really, is he fearing the Lord? I mean, he's fast asleep. <laughs> and you can see he'd rather, them, he'd rather them throw him overboard and die than humble himself. Verse 10, Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. They really didn't think about it, but when the storm came up and trouble came, isn't it interesting how people, they're praying to their gods. 
but they cast lots. Um, we'll, we'll talk about these things. So back at verse four, the Lord sends out a storm. The Lord sends out storms. He puts storms in our life. We talked about uh, gold being refined and having to go through the fire to clean off the, the dirt and the mire. And the, that's how you purify gold. And so God is allowing a storm to come, not only in Jonah's life, but in these men's lives too. He allows that to happen. One thing we need to all understand is our disobedience affects others. Amen. If we're disobedient, we're going to affect others. Jonah's being disobedient. And he's affecting these other men. They're thinking they're going to lose their lives. I mean, they're th they've thrown stuff overboard. They're trying to lighten the ship, and they think it's going to be broken up. Jonah has affected them. Um, let's look at some scriptures here. Go to Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12. Adam's sin affected us. Affected everybody. Infected and affected. Because we've all been infected with sin now. Romans 5.12. You know, when Adam and Adam and Eve did what they did, it just, hey, it, it's, it's affected the whole world. Animals die. Animals are beaching themselves. Trouble, they're crying out. Uh, Y'all hear these stories sometimes, they're not stories, but they're uh, like in Arkansas or Kansas, different places, and then all these, all of a sudden these birds, just hundreds of them just drop out of the sky and die. You know, um, the Bible says creation groans, cries out. And I believe when whales are beaching themselves and, and these different things that happen to animals, I believe that animals are crying out because they're affected. They're affected um, by man's sin. But Romans 5, 12, wherefore, as by one man, one man sin entered in the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Because of what Adam and Eve did, because their disobedience to God, it affected everybody. Everybody down the line. Um, Abraham, Abraham, we don't want to be picking on Abraham, but Abraham, um, he disobeyed God when God said, hey, Sarah is going to have a baby and he's going to be your lady. Sarah came up to him and said, hey, uh, I'm too old for this. It's not going to happen. Here, take Hagar. Folks, that's affected us to this day. To this very day, the Arabs, Ishmael, the Ishmaelites, the, 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 the line, they're a great nation because God said everybody that comes from you is going to be is going to be a great nation. And uh, right now we need to pray for Israel. We need to pray. Um, they're being surrounded. Um, you know, there's a lot of protests going on in Israel right now. Uh, Netanyahu is trying to. I think their judicial system is bad as ours is nowadays, and he's trying to make some changes. And we can say good or bad, but there there needs to be changes in our country. Um, and not in the in this sense that it needs to change as far as our system, but our system has become very corrupt. And that's happened in Israel. Rich people get away with stuff. A lot of, um, you know, it's all this breaking news about Hunter Biden. I mean, I, we knew this for the last four or five years. And it's talking about a mountain load of evidence against him. And his dad should be in jail. The president should be in jail. Biden should be in jail. The brothers should need to know. Sisters and cousins, all, all of them are getting kickbacks and making money. I mean, it's just sad. It's sad, but no prosecution. Hillary and Bill, they, man, their people dropping like flies around them, dying, being killed. I mean, it was just nothing. And it's sad. So our, our, our judicial system is not for fairness anymore or rightness. It's who's got the money. I say Trump might be an ex ex exception to that because they don't like him and his policies. But Trump's brought a lot of stuff on himself too. He has brought a lot of stuff on himself. Folks, I don't, I don't, in my personal opinion, but I don't think our country's gonna be very good off if, if he wins again. I don't, I, I, I don't want, um, uh, uh, you know, Biden or a Democrat to win, but uh, he's, he's got a lot of things himself. He's going hard after DeSantis. He's going hard. He says Florida's the worst state to live in. That's what Trump's saying. And he's praising Newsom out in California. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, this is hearing from his own mouth. And it's crazy. I know that DeSantis is his, his closest rival as far as for president. But why would you attack 
one of the states that opened up and, and, and DeSantis is going hard after Disney World, he's making a lot of stands about a lot of things. And I don't know his end goal, who he really is, but as far as what he's doing, he's fighting a lot of this stuff. And Gavin Newsom is a communist from California that that's destroyed that state. So be be careful, be careful. And, and yeah, they're still doing him wrong. He's he uh, as far as Trump and how they're treating him and stuff unfairly. But just because the judicial system's unfairly treating him, pay attention what he's saying. Pay attention what he's saying. But anyway, we will affect others. Our lives will affect others. So Abraham and what's going on? I kind of got off on Israel, but pray for Israel. They're they're Iran is giving money to the Lebanon Hezbollah to Hamas. To the uh, uh, to the um, Huni Huni, it's not a Huni. It's somebody Sunni. down in uh, uh, Yemen. Sunni. Not no not no not the Sunnis <laughs> in Iraq, but they're giving money to them too. Hutu, the Hutu in, in Yemen, and and they're I mean like Israel surrounded, and uh, uh, in Lebanon they have I, I don't know how many thousands of rockets pointed to Israel right now, and they're just surrounded. And it, and it almost appears that there might be a like a war that's getting ready to happen. And that would, that would very easily, I'm not saying it is, but very easily usher the Antichrist to come in and broker a peace deal. We're not at Gog and Magog where Russia and China are coming yet. Or Iran itself. Because Iran is Persia. You understand that? Iran is Persia. Iran and parts of Iraq, that is Persia. And the king of Persia is going to rise up in the last days. Yeah, sad we're helping it, but it's going to happen. Because God said it was going to happen. But Abraham, Adam, Achan, if you went to Joshua 7, Achan, he saw the Babylonian garment, he saw the wedge of silver, and he saw that it was good, and, and took it and buried it. You know, his whole family paid for that. His whole family is brought out and killed, not just him. So our disobedience can affect other people's lives. David, um, in Samuel 24, 2 Samuel 24, I believe, David he numbered the children of Israel. They weren't supposed to do that. God said, don't do it. And God sent a plague and thousands of people lost their lives because of David's disobedience. So here's Jonah being disobedient and it's affecting others around him. But our disobedience affects others. Another thing I want to say is people cry out to what they know. When people really get to the place to where they're going to cry out to something, they're going to cry out to what they know. They're going to cry out to what works in their life. A lot of people try God. A lot of people might go to church. But when, when the rubber hits the road and the troubles come, they are going to cry out. A lot of people are crying out for the government to help them. They're not crying out to God. And so understand, these, these guys, hey, the, the mariners, they're in trouble. They, they know about this God. They know about Jonah, but they really don't ask him a lot of questions. So when the trouble hits, who are they crying out to? They're crying out to their gods. They're not crying out to the true God. Later on they do, but at this point they don't. And it's interesting as we go through this that God can take sometimes our disobedience and turn it into something good. Because God's sovereign in that. God can do that. Now, it, he didn't make it. And don't ever think because you did wrong and something came good from it, that's, that that's right. But these guys are going to get help because they're going to see who God is. God shows his power to these mariners. Because as soon as Jonah gets thrown overboard, guess what? The storm stops. So they know, they know who God is. And once again, everyone in crisis turns to something. Everyone in crisis turns to something. What do you turn to? A lot of times, the first thing we turn to is ourselves. Our initial reaction, our initial our initial go-to. Isn't that true so often? And then after we've hit the stone wall or something, comes, then we say, oh, Lord, <laughs> help me. <laughs> I went about it the wrong way. We want to get it to our first reaction is right. Our first reaction is towards God. Our first reaction is like some scriptures we read today. It ain't the horse. The horse ain't going to help us in the time of battle. Our strength. See, folks, we shouldn't be turning to our military. We shouldn't be turning to that. We need to turn to God and say, God, thy will be done. Because there's things going on in our military right now that make you sick. 
just make you plain sick. In our schools, our military DOD schools, they're ha they were having drag shows. They're having drag queens come into our military. Um, was it the Air Force? I don't remember what branch it was. I just I read it either last night or this morning. I can't remember that um, there was a complaint that that these it, it's in the DOD. And how do, how do you how do you dissimulate or how not dissimulate, but how, when you bring people together, assimilate? How do you bring it in? And there's guys that are transitioning to women, but they still have their guy parts going in and taking showers with the women. And the women are told to accept it. And so in this, in this, in this hearing that's happened in Washington, how, well, we're here to bring everybody together, bring a cohesive unit together. And the representative says, how is that bringing a cohesive unit together when, when you're negating people, uh, women, that, and you're putting them through this? And they can't answer a question honestly to save their lives. And we're talking women defending this. Because here's the thing is, everybody is so afraid to speak up about it. There's very few people that are speaking up about it. And, and folks, if, we, and, and if we're in disobedience and we won't open our mouths for Christ or open our mouths for right, guess what? We're affecting other people. And folks, it... Don't you don't need a platform? There's just a country music star that just got saved, and uh, he 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 canceled all his tours. And people were asking, "Well, you have you have this platform?" And he said, "No, I, you know you can you can like Elvis Presley and everybody else, Patsy Cline, you know, <laughs> you can just throw in some Christian music." And he understood you can't do that, folks. Be obedient. We don't need to be an influencer. We don't need to grow the web. We need to be obedient where we're at, where we're walking every day. And God will give us the platform he wants us to have at the moment. A lot of people are trying to get the platform and get the influence. And I feel sorry for some of these guys because they're going to be judged, judged for the opportunity they had and they didn't speak up. A lot of Christians, a lot of people that are out there in leadership roles, they won't speak against transgenderism. They won't speak against abortion. They won't stand. And yet they're millionaires in the name of Christianity. And it's sad. And their disobedience is affecting a lot of people. Folks, a lot of people are being disobedient and aren't speaking the word of God. And they're keeping their mouths shut. And, and, and it's sad. It is, it is so, it, it's, you know, I hate to bring it up, but it's a society we live in. Here you got these Christians being killed. Whether they're Christians or not in a Christian school there. And yet, nobody's talking about that. It's all about transgender and how they're being attacked. And they're the ones attacking. Somebody just uh, uh, shot a bunch of people, I don't remember where, in one of these places, and immediately they came out to why this person did it. But we got a, we got a governor that's, um, that's a Republican, we got, we got a Senate and all that in the state, and they will not tell us about this woman's manifesto. Because it doesn't fit their agenda. If it was a Trump, if it was if it was a Christian that shot those people, it'd be out there. But when those that that why can't you bring out? And this is why this person did this stuff because they don't they have an agenda, and disobedience, and and governors are being disobedient. People are so afraid of what people are going to say, and it's insanity. It's insanity. But we can affect and cause problems for others. The mariners all had their own gods. They wanted answers. They wanted answers from him. So they cast lots. Now we kind of we kind of think, you know, it's like rolling the dice or whatever. But you can see throughout the Bible where God's in this. Remember when there was trouble with Israel and Jonathan had eaten that honey? And there was trouble, and they knew there was trouble, and God wouldn't listen to them or wasn't hearing them. And it wasn't even that Jonathan did anything wrong. He didn't even know about it. But the king had made a statement that nobody's to eat, right? Jonathan did it, not even knowing. But this is how God, God holds accountability and authority in such high esteem. 
And so what happened was they cast lots to figure out, all right, why do we have a problem? Israel was on one side and Jonathan and, and Saul were on the other side. And the lot came upon them. And then the lot came upon um, Jonathan. There's many times uh, they, they um, cast lots to see who the um, next apostle is going to be. It took Paul's place in Acts chapter, chapter 1. So there is a way that God used that. Um, you ever seen a movie called First Fruits? It talks about the, um, oh, what were they? The people from Germany that went to, huh? Moravians. When they went to go to the mission field in the West Indies and to the sugar cane and all that, they did that. The church did. They were going to send people. And, and there's several that wanted to go. And what they did is they had a little box with two, two numbers in it or whatever, or two names or whatever. And they went and they said, Lord, we don't, know, we don't know how to choose this. So they reached in and one grabbed one, another one grabbed one, and, it would, and, and one that said no, another one that said yes. And that's how they chose. We think that's strange, but you know what? That's a belief that God's going God's to answer that. And you see it in the Bible, and you see it. And they sent the right guy. They sent the right guy. The other guy came later, and then even more came. So... Um, it's an example in the Bible. This is what they're doing here. Who's the problem? And the, and the lot fell upon who? Jonah. And Jonah was a the problem. These guys weren't even saved. Ah, well, what if we got the wrong one? <laughs> well, that's where you say, Lord, you know our hearts. You know who we are. You know what's going on. Um, you make that decision. So often we make decisions by votes. They didn't make decisions by the majority vote. They made because isn't that how we do it? We do elections, whatever, and, and we, we pick the majority. Could you imagine if we did that as a country? God, we don't know what to do. So we're going to put Biden's name in the box, and we're going to put Trump in the box. And have somebody selected, whoever gets selected, that's the one that God wants. <clears throat> you don't think God can't do that? I believe he can. I think he already does it. I know we vote and we think we pick the person, but God already says in Daniel that he's the one that selects who's going to be the leader because he knows the hearts of the people. He knows the hearts of the people and he gives to the people what they need. And, and, and though I don't like this, we need what we're getting because hopefully it will drive people to Christ. Hopefully the crisis, hopefully what's coming, folks, will drive people to Christ. God, help us to be obedient because we're talking about a storm that came. A storm is brewing. We're in a storm. And that storm's going to keep on getting worse and keep on worse. And, and, and what frustrates us is what? We see that people are making decisions to make it happen, right? We, we, see, we see our leaders making really, really dumb decisions. Well, I believe God's calls them to make those decisions. I do. With all my heart, I believe. Because it's, I don't think anybody's that dumb to make the decision they're making. <laughs> I believe God has blinded the hearts and blinded the minds. And they're making decisions and doing things, not only because they're wicked heart, but all right, God, God allows this. Why? What did he do with Pharaoh? He hardened Pharaoh's heart. Some of the people got wise and started bringing their animals in when, when, when Moses said, hey, this is going to happen. So he brought the animals in. He brought, you know, some stayed out in the field and they got, left their servants out in the field, left their cattle out in the field. But you can see people are starting to, and then when it was time for to go, man, they gave them their gold, they gave them their silver, they gave them their jewelry, they gave them the tapestry, everything they needed, just go. God hardened our heart. So let's not, let's not, let's, let's not think that there isn't ways that we can go to God and say, God, what would you have us to do in this matter? I believe he'll answer us. One of the things here too is hearing of God and believing are different than believing and heeding. Hearing of God and believing is different than believing and heeding. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. John chapter 2, I've given these before. John chapter 2. Number 23. 
Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. That's one thing people, folks, people cry and weep and all that and say, God save me. God looks at the heart. We look at the outward, and I'm not saying that that's, I, I believe those things are going to happen, but if Christ, it, you can cry out to him, but if he doesn't commit to you, and he doesn't say okay, then guess what? You can't make yourself get saved. You can't make yourself, but it's humbling yourself saying, God, help me. You know me. You know my heart. You know my feelings. You know where I fail. He's faithful. But it's God, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must what? Worship him in spirit and in truth. So it's not just knowing. A lot of people know a lot of things, but are they being obedient? Are they heeding what God is saying? Uh, James 2.19. I believe that's the verse that says the devils, the devils believe. But James 2.19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe in trouble. Hey, if you believe there's one God, <laughs> more power to you, you're doing well. That don't mean you're saved. The devils believe. Not only do they believe, but they tremble. They tremble, they fear, but they're not going to get saved. So there's a lot of people that say they believe. What happened with, um, who was it? Felix. When Paul spoke of righteousness and judgment to come, he trembled. And that's why it's important when we preach the word of God. It's the word of God that gets a hold of the heart and affects people. These guys are fearful. These guys are trembling. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And they come to Jonah and say, Jonah, what have you done? So the storm that God sent, it was sent because of who? Jonah. So the man who is at fault is fast asleep. It's his fault. <laughs> and yet these guys are, he is fast asleep. He is running from God. So is it going to pray even though they ask him to? <laughs> they ask him there. We just read it. Hey, they're all praying. Why aren't you praying there, buddy? Well, the reason why I ain't praying, I'm running from him. And I don't, <laughs> I don't want to do what he wants me to do. Man, that's a tough situation. So instead of being leading them, instead of leading them in prayer, instead of leading them in the right direction, he, he's running from God. He does not want to get involved. He does not, he, it's like he knows God will answer his prayer. He don't want to ask. <laughs> he don't want to say, Lord, all right, guys, this is what the Lord's telling you. Turn the ship around. Let's go back to Tarshish. I need to go to Nineveh. And, and so much as a sense as we, as we continue on, we're not there yet. He's going to tell them, just throw me in the sea, and the sea will become calm. He'd rather them kill him than get right. He knows death or obedience. Let's go ahead and look at verse 12 of that. He knows death or obedience. And think of how bad off Jonah is. He would rather die he would rather drown. So, so you think, well, the reason why he didn't go to Nineveh because he's afraid to die. Well, he, Sean, is he afraid to die? That's not, that's not why he don't want to go. He don't want to go because he don't want God to be merciful to them. So he'd rather die than God be merciful. And, and once again, it's something I've said before. Folks, let's be careful that we'd rather just God destroy everything and judge us like Sodom and Gomorrah because we don't care. And we think they're just wicked and need to die. No, they need salvation. Just like Nineveh needed salvation, people need salvation. And I, there's a guy at work all the time. I just wish they'd push the red button. It, it, it's his thought. We just need a nuclear war, this, this place. Yeah, it's messed up, folks. But we need to speak up. Turn to Christ. Turn to God. That's what's needed. That is what's needed. Someone, somehow, some way, we need to stand up. And, and like I said, 
and my God has given me an opportunity. I, I was thinking about while you you were talking up here again about work. I've had two hundred people go through there in the last four hundred four hundred years. <laughs> No, it's not been 400 years. It feels like it. That was a Freud and slip, huh? I'll have to tell Kaz that. I feel like I've been here 400 years. I do I do joke about him and tell him I feel like I've been there 28 years, dog years. But I've been there in four, in four years. There's been over 200 people going through there. And now in the last six months, five months maybe, I'm the one doing all the interviews. And I get some doozies. Just this past week, I said, all right, the interview's stopping right now. And I started witnessing to him. I started witnessing to him. And then when I got done, I said, okay, the interview's starting again. Now in a court of law, or however this world is, that, that that's not going to work. But at least I'm trying to make a distinction. At the same time, and, and the thing is, I, I think one of the guys, if he I was giving him a test... He said, come in, I'm giving you a test on how to, how to do something to see how you do. And I was still willing to hire him. My thing is, you do your job, I'll hire you. It's not my job to say who can get hired because of their moral life or not. My job is to hire people. I had a sodomite work for me when I was bakery manager. He was my best decorator. He got raises when he was supposed to get raises. Witness to him, talk to him. He was doing his job. The company I worked with didn't have a problem with it. I did as a Christian. But the thing is, that's not my position or my job. You, you understand that? So why not just witness to him? Be a testimony to him. You know, I, I get people to accuse me of all kinds of stuff. But I get, I get an opportunity. And he gets frustrated. I'm just more, it's like this last, I think eight <laughs> interviews this week. I got more. I had that ranch come in. So I'm in a position now that I'm going to, there's nobody else. I get to do that. And I praise God, I got the liberty to do it. Because it puts them at a risk too as a company. So y'all y'all keep that in prayer. I, I, you probably don't have the liberty where you're at as, as, as I got. But do what you can. Do what you can. I don't. I don't want you to think. Well, I, I just no. I mean, you do it in the bounds of what you're able to do. But do it, and don't be afraid. Here's the thing: is if they can take Jesus' name in vain, we can praise him. Amen. There, there come some times where you just have to, you know. And if you get called in office, well, they said God this and Jesus this, and all I said is He's my Savior and I worship Him. I'm not gonna put words in your mouth. That's that's. Your faith is your faith. But if they're gonna if they're gonna be one way, um, be careful that we don't open up our mouth and say, hey, you know, God will not hold you guiltless for taking his name in vain. Do it kind, don't do it in the flesh, but let's be faithful to be a witness and testimony. The world Amen. needs it. So he's at fault, he's running, he knows death or disobedience, and he's willing to die but not repent. Look at verse 12. Jonah 1, 12, I said we were going there and got sidetracked. And he said unto them, take me up. Well, let's verse 11. Then they said unto him, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempuous. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. Now, it's history. We'll probably get into next week. Did the men do that? Not at first, man. They had more character and integrity in him. They're like, no, we'll just row harder. <laughs> then they realized, well, Lord, please don't hold this accountable. And they throw him overboard. And the, and the sea was calm. They asked him, what are we to do? And, and he was, do you, do you think if, and I believe this, if Jonah would repent it to the Lord, and lay this not on their charge, but on me, Lord, I'll go. I think that would have calmed the sea too. At this point, he still doesn't want to go. At this point, he still wants to be a disobedient. At this point, he's like, no, <laughs> just cast me in the sea. God will calm it. Why? 
Because it ain't you, it's me he's after. He didn't expect God to have a fish there. He didn't expect any of that. He wouldn't like throw me to see a, sw a fish is going to swallow me. I'm going to spend three days in it. He's going to spit me out. No. Just throw me overboard. Let me die. I'm not going. After three days, you know, smelling sardines and all kinds of other stuff, he changed his mind. But he was, I mean, stubborn. Stubborn. God was gracious to him. That also lets us know, folks, that God is very long-suffering. God is a lot more long-suffering in our lives than we realize. Like I said today, he would be just to say, all right, you sin, you're done. <laughs> he doesn't. He lets us go and lets us go and lets us go and lets us go. Stretches out his hand, stretches out his hand, stretches out his hand. And he does it with Jonah. That's a good example of the long-suffering of God. The long-suffering of God. Because even after they do cast him out, God saves them. Look at us, Psalms 107. Psalms 107. Oh, if Jonah would have done this, or taught them this, they eventually do cry upon the Lord. But Psalms 107, 23, it's one of my favorite chapters. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and riseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. I mean, that describes these guys. They're at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves are ever still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And you think about this. Amen. These guys are praying to their own God. I mean, there's a lot here. They're praying to their own God, right? And they probably got gods that like sacrifices. Um, Molech, Ashtoreth, all these gods, these false gods, Zeus, all these false gods want sacrifices. I mean, you think of the grace of God because it probably wasn't nothing to them to believe a sacrifice. They sacrificed their children. They sacrificed their virgin daughters. I mean, the, the, the world that didn't know God or was against God, that's what they did continuously. So think about it for Jonah to say, hey, I'm the problem. Just don't, that's making a sacrifice, is it not? And yet God did not allow them to do it. Because that would have fit in already. And I don't think it would have been a conscience that bothered him. But there's something that caused him to fear God enough not to do that. Because it's not like they didn't know who God was. Remember the Philistines? Remember the Philistines when, when uh, uh, the Ark of God came into the camp? And the Philistines were like, they just brought the Ark of God into the camp. That's the God that destroyed the Egyptians. That's the God that did this. And they got serious. Now, they didn't turn to God, but they got serious. And quickly, like, man, we got to fight. <laughs> and here's the Israelites that have the God that came into their camp with Phineas and uh, what's his name, the two brothers that are, that are just doing all kinds of wrong stuff and God still let Israel be defeated. I mean, think about it. Sometimes the world, see a lot of the people are our work and the people we run into, they know there's a God. Now they're not submitting to him, they're not saved or whatever, but they know and that's why a lot of times they look at Christians and say, you believe in him, but and wrongly, but you know, if I believe in him, at least, or if I follow him, at least I'd serve him. I just don't want to. I like the things I do. <laughs> and it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a blasphemy and a, a poor testimony, us that are Christians, that we don't walk the walk, the walk the talk. Right. Look at Philippians 1.18. See, he's willing to die but not like Paul. He's willing. Throw me out there. You throw me out there and the sea will be calm. And guess what? When they finally do it, what happens? The sea gets calm. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Jonah, Jonah's, if Jonah would go to Nineveh, that would be his attitude. By life or by death, God will be glorified, right? Because he's being obedient in his life and he's going to preach and maybe they'll kill him, or, but it's by life or by death. Right here, no way. <laughs> I, I, I ain't living for you, just throw me overboard. I'll die, but I ain't living. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Jonah was not living for Christ. Jonah was not living for God. Jonah's wanting to do his own thing and be disobedient to God. 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Jonah couldn't say that. Jonah was ready to be offered, he's ready to be a sacrifice. But it's a wrong sacrifice, a wrong offering, because it's out of disobedience. He was not fighting the fight. He was running from the fight. He wasn't finishing his course. He's off course. And he hasn't kept the faith. Do you see the difference? And we can be a Jonah. Folks, and it's something that kind of we've been talking about. We can be a Jonah. We can be the Christian that's asleep. We can be the Christian that won't open its mouth. We can be the Christian running from God. And so don't let us think of Jonah. Where, where was it? Saul fell on a sword. A lot of these kings fell on a sword <laughs> instead of get right. And there's times that Christians are willing to fall on their sword, you know, be a martyr in the situation they're in instead of just humbling themselves like, God, you work in the matter. Lord, help us not to be like Jonah. See, contrast this with Christ. Contrast with Christ, contrast it with Paul, Acts 27. Where was Paul in Acts 27? He was in that ship. 14 days fasting. Paul's in this ship. He's not saying, throw me overboard. In fact, he's saving people's lives. There was a storm, and that storm was not because of Paul. That storm was for those men. And God had a, a plan that Paul and them were going to get to that island because there were some people that needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul was willing. And everyone on that ship was saved. Amen. Amen. Everyone on that ship was saved. John 7, 6. John 7, 6. John 7, verse 6. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. You know, it's, it's interesting as we're walking with the Lord, there's times things will come to us, and, and it's almost like we know it's not our time. I mean, there's several times we came upon stuff in Papua New Guinea, and it was like, you know what? I had I had peace. When, when, when I fell and broke my arm, broke my shoulder, and, and they were telling me, you're going to go to America, and we're not going to ever see you again because of the cancer I had, I, I, it, I wasn't worried. I wasn't worried. In a sense, I knew when it's my time, it's okay. But I felt it wasn't my time. You know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's odd, but it's... it's it's, I think as a Christian, we can know, you know what, it's our time. I'm not saying things can't happen and tragedies can't happen. But you just have a peace that passes all understanding. Amen. We're to be ready. We're always to be ready. Paul was. Jonah appears to be ready, but he's not. He says, I ain't listening to you. <laughs> I'm not going to be obedient. And look at Matthew 8. Christ knew his time. 
He wasn't concerned. Matthew 8. And, and this, is, this is one of the times when the, the disciples of him were in a storm. You see, you see it a lot in the Bible. Knowing them, they were in a storm. Were they not? You got Jonah, you got, you got storms where Solomon, was it Solomon sent out ships? Was it Solomon or his son sent out ships? And he, or, or Hezekiah. And God destroyed them all. It wasn't what, God didn't want him to do that. Um, so there, the God, there's storms throughout the Bible. And we talked about Paul, but Matthew 8, 23, 27, there was a couple with the disciples, but I want to read this one. And when he was entered into his ship, the disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Now, this is totally opposite from Jonah. Knew his time wasn't ready. He knew the ship wasn't going to sink. Jonah really didn't care whether the ship sunk or not. The attitudes are different. And you can say, well, you don't know that. Well, you can read it in the sense of, hey, just throw me overboard, guys. When they wake up Christ, he's like, where's your faith? You know, they, they could have, this storm could have gone until they got to land. They weren't going to sink. They were not going to sink. Um, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea and so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep and his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, why are you fearful? O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. <laughs> but the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? And when he was come to the other side of the country of the uh, Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils. Now there's another point, there's another place where this, this is talked about, and it's like as soon as the storm is stopped, they're at their destination. So it's not like they were even out in the middle of the ocean or the sea. I, I, I should have found that verse, but it's interesting. We're not talking about being awake or asleep in the sense of, of you're not aware. Christ knew what was going on. Hey, guys, I got to go to Jerusalem and die. We're not dying in the sea. Why are you fearful? You're not going to perish. A lot of times we get afraid. We get in a storm. Folks, and the storm's brewing, and the storm's going, and it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse. But we're in Christ. We're safe. And once again, I'm not saying we're safe in the sense they won't take me to jail or take you to jail or we lose our lives. We're safe in the fact that I have an inheritance that can't be taken away. God is concerned about that. God is, he's more concerned about our inheritance and our affections being above than here on this earth. And he doesn't mind in a sense we lose everything physical if we're putting rewards up into heaven. He doesn't have our mindset. But we have to learn to trust him. Like we talked in Sunday school today. Abraham just kind of, the famine, the grief. We, we are coming upon a grievous time. The, the, the more we think about this, the more I'm like, Lord, you, you definitely led us to study the right things because we need to study these things to see how you are and how our faith needs to be in you because it's going to be a grievous famine and the famine is not just going to be food. It's going to be a lot of things that are happening around us and we need to look to Christ, our Savior. They could have been in a storm all night long, but they still would have been safe because Christ was with them. Christ was with them. Is Christ with you? Are you with Christ, more importantly? If any man love God, the same is known of him. So it's very important that we know, we, we know that we're saved, but that he knows us. <laughs> That's very important. Very, 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 very important. It's going to be grievous. It's going to get grievous. But we need to look to the Lord. Look to the Lord. Don't be like Jonah. Don't be like Jonah and get so despaired that you think it's better off just to end it than to make a stand and help people. Amen? Let's, uh, I've skipped Henry a couple times. So I want to do some Henry reading here. Short chapter, short chapter. The plot thickens. Now, you know he, things are going wrong. He's, he, he, his, his alternator went in his car. His freezer went out, lost all his food. 
And so things are just, all these good things in life are not really good things in life. Events moved swiftly the next few days and weeks. The car cost Henry two days involvement, plus $48. And the well had caved in. The man said who finally came after they had been out of water for six days. And that was very costly to be exact, around $480. The electric man said that the unit had gone bad in the freezer and that this often happened even in new ones. For no matter how well things are built, there's always a limit, he reminded Henry. Oh, he's going to find out there's a lot of lemons in life. Of course, the freezer is under warranty, and there's only a $25 service call. But unfortunately, the food that was under war was not under warranty, and so Henry lost the beef, which had all thawed out. Since the weather was around 90 degrees at the time, it didn't take long to go bad. Henry argued that the power company should be responsible. But they said Henry should have called as soon as the freezer went out. And Henry said he didn't know about it, and they said they couldn't help that. And so he gave up and gave in. Poor guy. By the time he'd repaired his mowing machine and finished the field, the bad weather had come and it rained seven days, ruining all the good hay he had counted on for the cattle next winter. By the time the rain had stopped, the hay was black and beaten into the ground so badly that Henry raked it and burned it in the windrow. That was the day he sat down in the barn where no one could see him or hear him and sobbed with his face in his hands. It was not the sobbing of sorrow as much as it was a frustration and a loneliness that he couldn't explain. He tried to explain to Dr. Mason, Manson, I'm going to the doctor now, how he felt and couldn't. Dr. Manson was sympathetic and said Henry was working too hard and was nervous and so he prescribed some tranquilizers for Henry and some little white pills that would help him get a good night's sleep. But he was not to take them unless he was desperate for sleep. Henry found himself more desperate as the days went by. His appetite seemed to be growing worse, and he noticed that when he ate certain foods, his stomach burned and pained, and he had constant headaches. He's got a, a hiatal hernia now, and he's getting heartburn. One thing helped, though. He learned from TV all the popular remedies, and his medicine cabinet soon boasted a small, well-stocked pharmacy. There were three or four kinds of headache medicines for his three or four kinds of headaches, his tranquilizer, sleeping tablets, anti-acid medicines for the stomach, distress he had, he had so frequently, laxatives, and of course, the latest in cold medicines. The next crisis came when he sat down and re realistically looked at his financial situation. He had never really done this, and somehow, the buy now, pay later plan and its full significance had never really grasped Henry. At the round table late at night, he was shocked by the actual figures. The bills that had been coming had been hurriedly stuffed in what Henry had termed his bill box. In reality, it was a neat little box in which he brought Esther candy from Wiggles General Store on Valentine's Day a long time ago. When he poured the bills, pulled the bills, poured the bills out on the table, along with the payment books and duplicate credit cards that had accumulated in the months past, Henry saw a form formidable mountain built out of the small stones of miscellaneous bills. A quick tally told him the story. Approximately 285 per month in regular obligations, an accumulation of nearly 1,000 in miscellaneous bills, including a large one for the well. The book from the bank lay in front of him as a mute reminder of a $7,500 mortgage. He saw no possible way of ever paying, not even in the 20 allotted years. 20 years to pay $7,500. Man, I wish that. I'd have that paid off in no time. Trying not to panic, Henry thought, there's to be a way out of this, and I've got to find it. Esther came in from the PTA meeting and said, what are you into? Henry said, just looking at our obligations, and frankly, Esther, I'm scared to death. Scared of what, Henry? It's not as bad as you imagine. Everything's all right. Remember, Henry, we have each other, and as long as we don't change, nothing will change. Now, she's not around anymore. She's at the Canassa Club. She's at the PTA Club. You know, she's having fun, and he's, he's shouldering all this. We have whispering pines, the children, and all the good things in life, and, and these bills are just one of the costs involved in it all. Think how thankful we should be that the Lord made all these good things possible for us. Remember how it was before? With a sickness creeping over his heart that he couldn't explain, Henry did remember. <laughs> he closed his eyes and he could see himself walking behind the marriage on a spring day. The sun shining, the earth bursting forth in its clean green suit of light. And ha the happy waters of Sycamore Creek bubbling with pent-up enthusiasm. Birds singing their chorus. And most of all, time. 
Time to hear and see it all and then make it all in. Take it all in. He remembered the unheard evenings on the porch, the plaintive note of the whippoorwill, the night with its soothing noises like a tranquilizer upon his heart. He remembered how it used to be when the children were tucked in and he and Esther sat on the porch and talked, loved and lived. He remembered how with mind and heart clear, he laid down with the smell of honeysuckle, drifting through the open window and slept and slept. Henry wished he could just once more capture that time and that he could be in his bed like he used to be and morning would never come. With a return to reality, Henry suddenly realized that he was not remembering how it was before like Esther was. And he didn't know how to tell her what progress had done for him, or rather, to him. He explained to Esther that their monthly obligation far exceeded their income, and that there was no possible way to balance such a swollen budget. They talked and figured and schemed and came to the conclusion that Henry must have more income if they were to make ends meet. He was yet to learn that whenever he found out how to make ends meet, something would move the middle again. The needed income could be realized if Henry could spend up, speed up production on the farm. He said time was what he needed desperately. He said he couldn't understand where the time went. No sooner did he get in the field until it was evening. The deep involvement of the things he possessed had done its work in whittling Henry's day from 12 full free wonderful hours to a few jump, jammed and troubled with problems. Each day he slipped further and further behind. The fields were running down, the cattle were only half cared for, and the fences almost all needed replacing. Finally, they reluctantly agreed that the mares were costing Henry lots of valuable time. By the time he caught them in the morning, brushed them and talked to them, fed them, harnessed them, and was ready to go on the field, an hour and a half had been wasted. Henry had never thought of this time as wasted before, especially since Old Brown had been killed. He looked forward to the time, for the horses remained in his mind as one of the few things that had not changed. Always the same, they linked him to happier times. He talked to them often as he had, would have talked to Esther if she had the time, but the mares were never in a hurry. Somehow they remained stable and strong, and he was sure that nothing would ever change them. But facts are stubborn things. They don't change. The fact was they, they had served their usefulness, and a tractor was the only answer to speeding up a slowed production. With the decision made, they planned how to accomplish this, and the only answer seemed to be, a second mortgage on Whispering Pines. Henry agreed to see Will Jenkins first thing in the morning. The morning came as it always does and it was raining. This relieved Henry somewhat of the guilt of spending another day of involvement instead of doing the many things that needed to be done. On the way to Chamberstown, he thought of the help the needed, he needed and wished the boys would show more interest in the farm. He couldn't blame them too much there was so much to do. The football and the basketball schedules were time consuming and Esther was right in saying that they only go to school once and shouldn't be saddled down with responsibility. I mean, that's the attitude of people today. No, you need responsibility because you're going to be responsible all your life. Um, Hilda helped some around the house, but it was the farm that worried Henry. He had heard the boys talking one night while he was in the kitchen and they were in the dining room working on their homework. Brennan said he didn't understand why Henry wanted to mess around with the old worn-out farm when other men were working only four hours a week at the plant in Chamberstown and making five, five times as much money. Jeff had agreed and said he, was, he sure never wanted to be stuck in the country for life and that he was going to college and make something of himself. These things had hurt Henry, but he was being hurt so much lately that he wondered if he was only overly sensitive. He remembered what Mr. Manson, Dr. Manson had told him and he figured his nervous condition accounted for most of it. After all, the boys would have to decide what's best for themselves. As for himself, he had made his decision years ago while trailing along behind his father in the South 40 as he plowed one spring. He would never leave Whispering Pines, and Shiloh would be his final resting place. Soon he was talking with Will Jenkins, and reluctantly Will agreed to an additional loan of 3000 Henry explained that 1000 be used to pay off accumulation of bills and 2000 for proposed tractor and equipment. With the sale of his gray mares, he hoped to have a little to go on and tied him over. As his dad used to say, Will talked frankly about the easy credit system and what it was doing to people. But Henry said he didn't intend for it to ever change him. And this situation in his life was only temporary. Soon with the new tractor and all, things would change. He was sure as they did. And see, this banker understood. And he's telling him this is happening to everybody. The new mortgage was five years at 7% and 
And it all totaled $4,050 at 60 payments of $67.50. This increased Henry's obligation around $352 per month, but he was sure he would overcome the increase as well as meet the standing obligation with a new tractor. Well, not really new, for new ones cost twice the amount Henry had to spend. He was fortunate to find a tractor with the necessary implements in fair shape for $2,000 he had to spend. It was 10 years old, but the man said models didn't make any difference to a tractor, and Henry could see that it didn't as long as the tractor worked good. And this tractor did. It kind of scared Henry at first. So much power at his fingertips, and he had to go slow until he got the feel of it. The boys showed first interest in the farm for a long time, for they were fascinated with the tractor. They wanted to help as long as they could try their hand at the tractor, which Henry didn't allow too much, for it was the only means he had of making out. They never understood this and often murmured to Esther that Dad sure is tight with that old tractor. Henry had his disappointment, too. When he hired Bill Baxter to take the mares to the sale for him, he was shocked to see that they only bought $75 apiece. Henry was so angry, he almost cried in public when the hammer fell, and those strong, honest, good mares went for such a penance. When he loudly complained to the men around him, he was quickly told that nobody wants a pair of old work mares. What good are they? They said, nobody, seems them, seem, nobody needs them anymore. Henry came home and never told anyone that when he went to the barn to put the tractor away, he couldn't bring himself to walk to it. He went into the big empty box stall that had belonged for so many years to those wonderful gray mares and cried. Nor did he ever tell them that each time he went to the barn to get the tractor, he had to turn his head so he couldn't see the harness, now covered with cobwebs, and chafe hanging in the wall stall. Somehow one of the last links with whispering pines as it used to be was broken forever. What do you think, Miss Nancy? A lot of reality, though. So a lot of people that live their lives like this, running, running, and running, and and and, and look at the kids. And this is what broke up the family, guys. And I'm not saying you have to go back to that, but it takes work to have family time. It takes work to do things with the family. Why? Because everybody's doing their, going every which way. People are traveling this, and the kids be, are becoming more important than the family. Henry has lost his authority and lost his headship to where everybody's just, scattered he's concerned about the farm and everything but he's losing his family he's lost his wife they're not spending time together you know so anyway don't be depressed i mean it's, it's a good book it shows a lot don't. Yeah, the book is depressing though so it's like <laughs> the story is depressing so it's hard it's all right I'll, I'll find another book that's happy. <laughs> Amen. God bless y'all. Hope to see you Wednesday. Be good. Pray for one another. Amen. Amen. I'll cover your prayers. I know Sean does and each of you. We'll pray that Mr. Cox gets here safely and y'all have a good fish fry.